I, I think I'll be trying something very different today, uh, and we'll see how it goes. I actually have two presentations uh, on, on quite different topics, uh, and uh, hopefully you like at least one of them. Uh, one has a bunch of code, one doesn't have any code. Um, so if you're disappointed with one, then the next one might actually be good. So there's one thing that we need to talk about uh, where we begin. This... This is not my doing, okay? I was not involved in that choosing whatsoever. So don't, don't blame me. We have some marketing people that aren't, you know, they're marketing people, right? Um, and another thing, which is kind of fun, like I've, I've sort of been blessed to travel around and speak at conferences in a number of different countries, and you're trying to explain where Sweden is, and they don't even know where the Nordics are, or Switzerland, etc. So I usually show them the first euro coin and then try to explain where Sweden actually is. The interesting part is when you show the first euro coin is that they didn't include Norway uh, because they weren't in the union. So it looks like something that's not that nice. Uh, but every time I show this picture, I can tell them, at least I'm not from Finland. <laughs> so thank you for taking that part of it. Um, I also think an interesting thing that you, when you give different presentations um, is kind of the climate that we've been growing up with. Like in the Nordics, like it's, it's completely dark half the time of the year. And I don't know if you have the similar ones, but we have these in Sweden, the, the, the warning signs. And, and it's basically like every warning ends up in a, in a grim death. Um, and, and as a child, if you grow up and you see this, right, you, you're, you're terrified of everything. You just shut up and you stay on your own. Uh, and I don't know why you would draw this. It doesn't really matter. Like, everything you do ends up in a crushed head. So I'll, I'll mention briefly what I do. So I, I currently work for uh, Google, uh, and my role at Google is that I work with developer relations for the Nordics region. Um, and what that means is not only the web, it, it's cross-product. So basically anything that Google does that targets developers, uh, which gives me a fairly new view, I guess, and, and perspective on the stuff that I'm doing, like I've been doing web for a long, long time, and it's interesting to get into other areas, like, like this, I feel like home here, like I actually understand the presentations of what you're talking about, uh, whereas with all the other product, it, it's a really interesting learning process and seeing what the needs are. Uh, one thing I want to mention, um, sort of before I forget as well, and especially for the disk crowd, is that at Google, we have something called Google Developer Experts, uh, and we're trying to find experts for any kind of different area. Like, you know, it could be Android, it could be cloud, etc. cetera. Um, but why I think it's interesting here is that we also have Google Experts for Chrome. Uh, if, I, and if I am to find any experts on Chrome and the web, uh, it's basically more the open web than, than Chrome. Uh, it should be here, right? Um, so I just want to mention briefly that the the part about uh, experts is that if you become an expert, you get the direct access to that product team at Google. So you can you sign this NDA, as you should do, uh, but then you get advanced information about what's being worked on. You can have direct feedback to the team. Um, you also have different summits with different other experts uh, and, and much more. And you get tickets to Google I.O., if nothing else. Uh, so, you know, if you think you're really good at the web, which I sort of hope applies to all of you, and, and this might be an interesting aspect, come and talk to me about it. Um, and the only thing that's sort of expected for the people we're looking for are people that are visible in the community. And that can be organizing meetups, writing books, or, or blogging a lot, um, sharing code, etc. cetera. Um, if it sounds good, talk to me. If not, that's, that's completely fine. And what I want to talk about today uh, in, in this first talk, the second talk is actually going to be about the web. Uh, the first one is about mobile in, in general and trying to take the sort of the, the broad bird's eye view on it. And it's just, um, I, I do like data and, and working for Google, is, it's pretty good in that sense because Google actually seems to like a lot of numbers as well. Um, and at Google, a lot of things are, are naturally data-driven. Um, and I think that's an interesting part. Like, when we do stuff, like, I'm going to show a lot of numbers and talk about them today. It doesn't mean it's the truth, but it's just good to know about them and then maybe help you form decisions when you build stuff or, or what to target. 
And looking at the mobile uh, world right now, is, um, and, and this is sort of based on different surveys and reports and data, is that iOS uh, has a pretty strong grip on the high-end um, market on devices. Um, and Android has control over uh, pretty much everything else there. Um, and it's also interesting to see, if you look at the different numbers for Windows Phone, that developers get more interested, but users don't seem to care. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if it actually ever takes off, or if it's just going to be like a marginal product. Um, I, I do think more options is better. Uh, we do need that competition in, in any area. And looking at the market share um, right now, um, uh, wow. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's just comparing um, um, Androids to the other ones. And, and looking at the more concrete numbers, um, sorry, I'm just having a terrible view here. Um, is that uh, Android right now um, has shipped around uh, slightly older numbers, but, but around 250 million different units. Uh, I, I think the count is that you have 1 billion people using Android devices right now uh, or having access to them, which, which is basically 85% of the market share. Uh, Apple has about 11% market share. Uh, it's, of course, different in the Nordics uh, because people in the Nordics have um, more money, more high-end devices, so you, you do see a shift in that sense. Um, and also um, seeing sort of which uh, market segments that keep on growing is the, the low-end devices. Like people in, in Western Europe and in North America, uh, you know, most of them have mobile phones. Uh, but if you start looking at India and, and Africa and South America, it's kind of interesting to see, like, I mean, there's an estimate that 2 billion more people are going to come online in the next few years, and then more or less all of them will do that through different mobile devices. So it's interesting to see what we can offer them and how you can sort of target them as well. Um, and I think for me, like today we were meeting a, a number of companies here in Helsinki and just talking about gaming in specific. And I think when you live in the Nordics, like if, if you speak Finnish or you speak Swedish, you kind of realize pretty quickly like this language is not going to, you know, help me worldwide. Um, it, it's going to help with my closest peers and that's it. Um, and I think this is sort of the same things, like even if you build apps or websites, et cetera, you need to target the world. Like if you aim smaller than the world, you're not doing it right. Uh, because if you do something local, I mean, there are very, very few things that actually work out uh, locally. Uh, it has to be like a bigger scale. And talking about Android, sure, okay, let's say about 85% of the market, um, there are a number of different devices as well um, and resolutions. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, you can see it two ways, and, and I can be the salesy guy, like, look at all the options. Uh, but, but it's kind of interesting to see, uh, I mean, it is an interesting challenge. Um, how can you target all these kind of different devices, these different resolutions? Um, I mean, to be honest, to, to gain 85% uh, market share, there will be a number of players and a number of different devices. So this is not inevitable, um, but but more or less, like you had to sort of play the game of, of everyone to, to get there. Um, but I think right now, especially if you talk developers, the, the challenge, I mean, if you do web stuff, responsive web design, that works fine, right? Um, and on different uh, devices like Android and iOS, the resolutions and DPIs, that's not too big of a problem. It's just more having low specs and, and different drivers, et cetera, what, what will actually work uh, and how will things actually render. Uh, if you do something with Canvas, is that going to be lagging if you have request animation free? And then we also look at users. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see user trends. I, I just love things like this when people almost get it but don't. So this could be half the people in my parent generation, I think. Um, but looking, and especially um, in the US, there are a number of different business numbers. Um, but looking at app usage right now, um, Facebook is by far the most popular app and just seems to keep on going. Um, and if you're looking at different uh, age segments, especially when I meet people as well, like if I meet people who are um, around 20, uh, more or less all of them don't use Facebook or they use it because they have to because of events or, or maybe a messenger, but not for status updates. And usually when I talk to them, they say like, you know, 
why would I post stuff about my life? It, it's so uninteresting. No one cares, right? Um, people my age has, you know, we haven't gotten that. We just keep on posting shit over and over and over again. Um, so it's interesting to see the trends. Um, and I think I heard someone on the subway the other day, like, people over 30 shouldn't be allowed to use Instagram, uh, which is probably a good rule, I guess, and in general, for, for any kind of social media. Um, but it's also been interesting um, from the Google perspective. Um, like on, on this list, um, the Google apps are, are number two, three, four, six, and seven, and 16 out of the top 25. Uh, and if you look on iOS, if I remember correctly, like out of the top 20, 25 apps, uh, Google has five to 10 apps uh, in and out of there as well. So it's an, an, an interesting symbiosis when you sort of compete on some levels and, and then you really need each other on, on other levels. Um, also, and, and it's kind of interesting to mention in Finland, like at least for the US, uh, like the top 25 apps, none of them are games. None. Um, so everyone keep on talking about games and, and some uh, game platforms and companies, especially, I mean, if you have Finland, you have Supercell and Rovi, et cetera, uh, really, really successful. Everyone knows about Angry Birds, for instance. Uh, but the popularity is not competing with apps on, on this scale. Um, and Netflix, naturally, uh, is one of the top apps. Uh, it does have the subscription, and it's probably the most successful app when it comes to using a subscription model. Um, and, and honestly, I, I, I respect Netflix in the sense, like, whatever kind of device you pick up, whatever kind of, you know, sort of shit you hold in your hand, it will support Netflix. Um, so they've done a, a fantastic work in, in just targeting any platform that's out there. Um, and I think it's great for them. Um, it's also being Swedish and, and seeing here that uh, Pandora is really huge in the US and Spotify is not within the top 25. Um, and, and for us, especially in Stockholm, you sort of have to use Spotify while listening to ABBA shopping at IKEA because it's kind of the local pride, right? Uh, but it hasn't really taken off to that extent in the US at least. And looking at shopping habits, uh, it's interesting to see now on the web uh, that people shop more uh, through mobile devices than on laptop, desktops, etc. Um, I, I don't. Um, I don't know. I, I need a keyboard. Maybe it's kind of the programmer approach. Like I, I need proper things to press, but um, to buy stuff. Uh, but it's interesting that it's kind of overtaken, and this trend keeps on going. Uh, it's not sort of stopping or slowing down. It's just more and more buying on on mobile. And. If we look at the different app types that we have and, and, and the usage numbers, um, looking at health apps, for instance, 9% uh, uh, of, of the people using apps there are women and 4% men, so it's a much stronger focus for women for, for health apps. Uh, for entertainment apps, uh, it's always uh, almost twice as many women than men using entertainment apps. Um, and then sort of same goes for lifestyle, social networking, etc. Um, and also um, looking at games. And I, I think sort of these things are interesting to compare. I mean, we can look in this room, which has some level of gender diversity. Um, I've, I have meetings where I only meet um, uh, men all the time. Um, which is interesting because if you start digging into the numbers and then sort of what kind of, who are the people building stuff and who are you targeting? And then if you see, if you look at all the different graphs and all the different uses levers, uh, women are using more things, buying more things and being more loyal to different products. Um, so it's kind of interesting that that's not that strong of a focus on uh, sort of what women want us to build. They, they, they still use it apparently, uh, but this could be even stronger. Uh, so I think sort of my, my advice when you try and target your device uh, or, or and service, et cetera, target it for human beings. Like, don't have a, a gender target group, right? <coughs> and one, one thing that was announced last year um, at Google I.O. was Android Wear and, and then some other company released a watch recently, apparently. And, um, and it was interesting to, to test that early on and, and seeing like, that because you know, growing up and, and reading uh, uh, agent comics, et cetera, and, and you would talk to your phone, uh, sorry, watch, and, and you would see what happened, right? So initially, 
I was testing this and, and just trying to, to, by voice, sending a text message um, uh, to my girlfriend. So I tell it, you know, you, you would think that the key voice commands are really sort of fine-grained and it would work out of the box. So I tell him, you know, send a text. And of course, the watch replies, send a cow. The interesting part, of course, is when you get stuff like this, you need to so say, what is this? Send a cow. And apparently it's a non-profit um, where you can send a cow to people in India who needs a cow, uh, which is great, right? So I'm, you know, I'm, I didn't get my text sent, but I get educated. But you know, I, I still want to send the, the text, so I, I try again. So then I get Sam the Sea Cow, um, which is an American comic targeted at, at different children. Um, and just sort of keep on pushing it. But it, sometimes it works uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, and it's, of course, it's getting better and better and better. Uh, those things were most of last year, and it's more or less iron out. But, but it's interesting to just having these different things, like when you talk to some kind of device, like your phone or your watch, and it works most of the time. Um, and, and now, from the sort of Google perspective, uh, we're having Android TV, uh, which is going to be the default operating system on all Sony TVs going forward and a few other providers. There's a small Nexus player that's kind of like the, the Apple TV. The difference between the Nexus player and the Apple TV is the voice commands, for instance. Like you have all the different voice commands for, for search. Google does like search. Um, so you can just talk to the device and you can look up different things. You can say to the device, you know, show me all the, the movies that won an Oscar in 2007. And it would just list them and you can look at them. Um, and for different apps, you can sort of implement voice support as well. Um, the other part, I'm sort of digressing, but the other part on Nexus Player is that you can also have most of the Android games on it. So you can buy a game pad to the Nexus player and you can play Android games directly. And I think it's gonna be interesting, like don't have any numbers but now, but let's let's take a year from now. And if people can have a game pad and, and play uh, proper games on your TV and you pay one euro for that game instead of 60 euros for a PlayStation game or Xbox, etc., you know, how will that change? Uh, is it probably some people are gonna say like, you know, like the, the music industry is like, no, this is killing our business. And I, I don't think so. I just think it's going to be a different approach on, on doing things. One key point, though, to, to point out, when you look at numbers, uh, numbers are really interesting. I love numbers. But at the same time, uh, correlation is also interesting. You can always find some correlation if you want to. Like how many, pe how many movies did Nicolas Cage do and how many people drowned in swimming pools? And it's the exact same graph. So. So I think you know numbers are great, but you always need to take them with a grain of salt and see how they sort of fit in with the different things that, that you do. So if you look at this, these different numbers, what's, what's the developer climate? Uh, what kind of different things do developers choose? And HTML5, uh, which is a broad term, but it's the, the most widely used language or approach to, to building stuff, 42% uh, to the developers. And then uh, Java and Android comes in on, on second. Um, I don't think there are any good numbers on Swift yet for, for iOS, uh, but Objective-C is um, pretty interesting as well. Uh, but if you look at both iOS and, and, and Android, where you know, these two massive platforms, is that 42% uh, on iOS, and uh, sorry, 47 on iOS and 42 on Android um, use something else than, than the language they're sort of supposed to be using, uh, which basically means they use HTML5. And, and JavaScript and, and web views and, and different things like that. And uh, then if we look at sort of the mind share um, on languages, uh, like what, what people would prefer or pick, um, it, it sort of said that Java is the most popular one, Objective-C is pretty popular as well, and then HTML5 is sort of catching up or, or being in, in, in the heels of it. And when you ask the developer, which platform they, they prioritize, um, it's just interesting to see which one they pick first and, and also why they pick it. Like if you compare, for instance, Android is pretty big um, and, and iOS as well. Uh, but why would you pick one over the other? Like what's the motivation factor? And also seeing the trend over the years. Like let's say uh, people pick a certain number of platform um, that seems to be going down. Like, um, in, in one year, uh, in general, app developers target 2.9 different platforms, uh, and for one year, it went down to 2.2. Uh, 
So the question is, over time, are people sort of going to pick the web? Is the web good enough to target everyone? Um, or will it just be iOS? Or will it just be Android? Um, and I think it's, it's interesting, but it's also somewhat scary. Because no matter if which platform it is, if they only pick one, you know, people will have less choice, et cetera, and it will just be too, too monoform. And another part uh, that I think is good to talk about, like people, uh, again, um, g big companies like Google and Apple will tell you how much money uh, app developers make. And that's great, right? People make money. But if you also look how few app developers are actually make money or, or enough money per month to, to make it worthwhile, uh, it's, it's staggering. Um, so they're kind of different uh, groups, like the, the have-nothings, uh, which make less than 100 US dollars per month, and, and the so-called, I, I love these terms, poverty-stricken, uh, which uh, they make between 100 and 1,000 US dollars per month, and, and you have the strugglers, and they make between 1,000 and, and 10,000 US dollars per month. And then the haves, uh, which is basically the people that have uh, good money. Uh, the, the people, like if they get a speeding ticket in Finland, they will pay a shitload of money. And, uh, but it, there's very, very few, right? Um, so it'll be interesting to see like, that only 12% actually make good money and, and the strugglers are sort of okay. And, and the rest are just really sort of fighting for existence. Um, and I think one part here as well, which I don't really have any information for, but I think personally, like one of the biggest challenges with the web, you can always say, you know, web versus native, et cetera. I think it's, it, it tends to be more complementary nowadays. There's some things that you can do on a native platform that might be harder to do on the web because the web is an open standard. You need a library that works on all the platforms, et cetera. Uh, but I think the biggest challenge for the web is, is still monetization. Like how, how do developers make money? because people are so used to, to having websites and free information, et cetera, and that's the way it should be. Uh, but I'm, I'm tr still trying to figure out, like if you look at Dational 5 games, WebGL, et cetera, um, there's hard, hard to find a good way for people to, to make money. And with, um, with the different app revenue here and, and, and the app poverty line, um, uh, I'd love to see this in a year and, and see how that's actually evolved, but I think this is probably going to stay the same. Like people won't be rich by building apps by default, which is sort of the, the message that you might get. Um, and also coming back to, to sort of games, and like 33% of developers make games, uh, but 57% of all the game developers make less than $500 per month, uh, which is more or less Nothing, right? That, that's like a beer in Norway. Um, so how, how can we sort of meet that? And, and how can you make that better? Um, and an interesting part here, if you look at the different app developers, what kind of users are they targeting? Um, do they go for, for like um, normal people, I was going to say, uh, consumers? Do they target professionals? Do they target enterprise? Um, and actually, like in, in this case, 67% go for uh, consumers um, and uh, kind of lower numbers on the other ones. Um, but then if you look at the developers who actually target enterprises, um, they're twi twice as likely uh, to be making more than 5,000 um, US dollars per app per month. Um, and I, I think this is just a thing. Like enterprise is not sexy or sort of alluring. Uh, you want to build nice, nice stuff and you get recognition and everyone knows your app and it's on the top list. But if you want to make money, enterprise is your best bet. Uh, bet. And, and that's how we sort of make it. And this is, well, kind of squeezing this in now. Uh, but for me, this is sort of reminding me of the way you look at things. Like, no, I have to target end consumers. Sort of the same with growing up and, and being terrified of quicksand reading comics, and I have no idea why. And also looking at the, the trends, um, and if you look at apps and, and which ones are actually successful, um, the, the tooling is, is basically key. And I think this was an interesting quote in one of the reports that the more tools the developer uses, the more money they make. Uh, but it's not really clarified, so I, I don't know. Um, I, I think at least as, as web developers, we just change editor once in a while because there's something new and shiny. Uh, so on, for instance, on Mac, it's going to be TextMate and then Sublime and then Atom, et cetera. Um, 
but with the tooling part, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, but apparently, at least, that's the trend that they see happening. And uh, to just briefly mentioning emerging markets as well. Like, it's basically, uh, if you both look at the, the income and sales and getting more users, um, but also market share as well, um, is that it's the emerging markets that are actually really growing. Like, like in the, again, Western Europe and North America, it's kind of the same usage level. Um, if you look, I think, for New York Times, if you have a subscription in New York Times, the average number of devices a user have um, is six devices uh, accessing the subscriptions. Uh, which is ridiculous, right? Um, but still, just the same number of devices. It doesn't really seem to go up that much. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing prices going down and down for, for different phones as well. And sort of the Google part in that is uh, just some money that we had on the side that put in $1 billion into marketing on Android One phones in India. Uh, and if you can sell a phone there for around 80 bucks, um, and actually just using one right now and testing it out, it, it's actually quite nice. And I think this is the interesting part to sort of go down for paying 500 or $600 for a phone and just pushing the prices down so more people can actually have smartphones. Uh, so this is, um, again, sort of just trying to give you the numbers, giving you the keys. I'm sorry, I'm getting old when I have such poor jokes. Um, it's nice though, a key hanger. Like if you play Zelda, this is excellent. You have to admit that. Um, so that's the first part, um, talking about different numbers. And, and the next one is actually going to be about web stuff. Hi. Uh, so looking at the web, for me, like I, I, I love the web. And I, and I think I, I definitely wouldn't be here without the web. And I've gotten so many. Uh, nice things, uh, or being able to do so many nice things because of the web, and meeting people, making friends, etc. Uh, but at the same time, if you look uh, at native mobile platforms right now, sometimes this is kind of what the web feels like. Like we, we're trying to mimic the native stuff to a certain extent, and and it's always like, you know, which one's going to win? And and I think, uh, I think that's a risk for the web. Uh, and there's been a few discussions like yesterday and, and maybe the day before. Um, people are saying that the web is not winning uh, the way it is right now. Um, with that said, uh, I, I thought I'd talk about a few things that are happening on the web that hopefully is making it easier and better for developers, not necessarily to compete with native or, or some native offerings, uh, but just as a developer, which are the things that are most needed, the, people that, uh, the stuff that people ask for? Um, and one thing is looking at in, in JavaScript and looking at promises. Um, and it's basically, um, if you build different things and, and you have different events, uh, you do, like with the multi-threaded approach, uh, you don't want to have something just being synchronous and locking all the other stuff up. Uh, and, and the upside with promises, uh, as opposed to just normal events, um, is that a promise can only succeed or fail once. And, and once it's done that, it's not going to change again. It's not going to be an event handler that keeps, keeps on being called over and over and over. Um, and, and I think the important part there, of course, is to make sure that, that your code is sort of relevant. Um, uh, as a web developer, um, usually you do something, the rendering hasn't really finished, uh, you do a set timeout zero because through black magic that works. Um, and I think promises hopefully will, will help with that to some extent. And Looking at promises, you have a, a few different um, states. So a promise could be fulfilled, uh, rejected, pending, or, or settled. Uh, so it's basically pretty easy to just check for a promise what the current state is at that time. And yay, code. Uh, so it's pretty easy to um, create a promise. And, and you basically send in two different arguments, which is just going to be the success handler and the error handler uh, when the promise actually goes through. And if you create a pointer to a, um, a promise, uh, you can then just easily reuse it. So you can call the promise and have it then, and then have the success handling or the error handling. Um, and the interesting part about this as well, that both of the arguments are optional. Um, so you can just add one callback for, um, for success or error, and, and you don't need the other one. Um, so it's basically completely up to you how you want to work with it. Another one is fetch. Um, 
And if you and basically all the things I'll be talking about today is sort of being based on promises and, and the, the wave or, or trend of how syntax is, sorry, syntax is, uh, will be looking in the future for a number of different APIs. And basically with fetch, um, it, it's based on promises and, and just trying to have a, a more simple and, and clean API, um, and again, sort of getting back from callback hell. And initially, it, it was made available for service workers uh, in, in Chrome 40, uh, but now it's enabled um, uh, for the Windows scope as well from Chrome 42. Um, and this is also our poly field that you can use for some of the use cases. And if you look at, at the good uh, XML HTTP request, uh, which is kind of interesting that it, something like this took off and then the entire web was based on its Ajax. Uh, but if you look at that, you, you have a pretty simple request, you have the parsing, you send in different values as well, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, but if you want to do the same thing uh, with fetch, the syntax is slightly different. So you get the fetch as a promise in this case, and then you have the success and the, the error handler and how you want to deal with the actual request. And I guess um, a, a quick question out of interest. Which syntax do you prefer? Do you like this or do you like this? Like, who prefers this one? And by default, the rest of you prefer this one or, or just want to go home, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Um, and what you can also do when you use the fetch thing uh, is to just easily check the different headers um, in the request as well. Um, so you can just uh, content type, et cetera. Um, and the, the interesting part, I think, about um, having uh, or sort of using fetch um, is that you have the different response types. Um, so basically, you have the basic type, which means you're in the same region. You can access everything. You can do all kinds of fetch requests. Um, you can do a course. Uh, so if you have the cross origin request uh, and you get the course header sent back from the server, um, you know that, okay, this is course. You can access certain parts uh, and just certain, certain headers as well. And you have opaque, uh, which basically means that you do request, but it's not really going to work out. And when you do your request, you can also sort of preset or, or, or force how you do request. Uh, you can tell, like, okay, this is just going to be a same origin request or course. Um, the course with, with a forced pre-flight is also interesting because you tell it to kind of do a pre-flight test if this request is going to take off or not, so you don't have to do the entire request with all the data, et cetera, unless you want to, so you just do a, a quick pre-flight um, or a general no course. Uh, and the way it looks when you actually do the first uh, request is that the second parameter is you send an object and you tell what kind of mode you want it to be sent back with. And then we have service workers. And, and uh, a friend of mine, Jake Archibald, wrote a nice article when he was talking about app cache and offline support and what he thought it was like. Um, and of course, the result, if you complain about something, okay, well, you build something better. Uh, so he and Alex Russell at Google and a number of people at Mozilla as well um, are working on, on just seeing um, a couple of things. Actually, service workers, uh, to some extent, is making sure that you have offline support on your mobile phone and, and other devices. Uh, but it's also about performance. Um, how can you use different approaches and just have to some extent, quicker caching or quicker file serving with all the round trips and then all the different requests and latency, et cetera. Uh, and basically, it's a, a script being run um, um, in, in the background. Uh, so basically, that's just like a um, web worker. Um, and right now, it, it's basically just you know handling network requests or handling caching. Uh, but for future use cases, they're looking into um, background sync and geofencing and such. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how far it can actually be, be pushed. Um, and it's also good to know that it can't really um, access the DOM. So it communicates uh, via post message. So you get all the different information that you can send that back to the requesting part, who can then in turn sort of update the DOM or, or similar. Um, and it, it's a network proxy. Um, and it's also interesting that uh, it's also sort of being turn off on a need-to-know uh, use basis. Um, 
So if you have, want to have kind of like a, a global state handler for your website, it might not necessarily be the right thing, or you need to really push and tweak it a bit. Uh, and again, the, it uses promises a lot. And I think for me, when I started looking at service workers, and, and sometimes still do, like initially it seems nice, and you sort of digging your way in, and you have promises, and if you're not used to that, you learn new code. So this was sort of my feeling in the beginning when I tried to look at it. So that's uh, apparently a, a Swedish stag party. Uh, I, I'm kind of disappointed that I wasn't invited. Uh, it seemed to be a good, good night. Uh, I don't know if the panda bear uh, burned, but but I think and and, and talking about service workers, um, that'll probably be the feeling they sort of carry with you. Um, but sort of trying to break it down, and, and a lot of this information is also available on the HTML5 Rocks website and a number of different articles. But if you're trying to break down how service worker work, uh, so let's say you load a web page um, for the first time, and then you install the service workers, and depending on how that goes with loading the service worker script, et cetera, uh, it's going to be activated or you're going to get an error. Um, then the service workers are going to be in the background and being idle, um, and then depending how and when you use it, it's either going to start fetching messages or it's going to be terminated. Um, and one part that sometimes isn't that popular, that to use service workers, you have to use HTTPS, uh, which is great for security. Uh, it's not that much fun at that time, setting up a website. Uh, and it's, we're also sort of discussing at Google, because if you want to um, recommend certificates or solutions for, for setting this up. Um, at, to some extent, we can't really sort of promote one um, certificate uh, provider, for instance, over another. So we're trying to find ways to just make this as easy as possible for developers. Uh, and the use case, or sort of the reason for making it HTTPS, is basically like with service workers, you get a lot of power. You can do a lot of different things on the website. So it more or less has to do that to live up to, to the sorry, <coughs> security standards that we should have on the web. Um, but at the same time, it, it could be a hassle. So if you look at the first step, um, and if you want to start installing a service worker, um, you do a quick um, uh, feature detection. And then you can just register your server worker. And, and then you put in the path to the file. Um, and the interesting part here, um, if you look at the path, that it starts with a slash, which basically means that it, it's being lo uh, loaded from the root of the website. So it basically means that anything that sort of goes for the fetch event um, on wherever on the website will sort of be uh, intercepted by the service worker. So you need to sort of make sure that you have a path that fits the need, and especially have different subparts uh, of your website. And within Chrome, uh, which is a web browser that we offer users, um, you can easily go in and just inspect the service workers that you have as well and just check the current state of them as well. And then when you sort of uh, keep on installing, um, you define a callback for the install event. Uh, and you also easily, in the JavaScript file, list all the different files that you want to cache. Uh, so which are the files that should be loaded, and then you should just sort of store them away. Um, and the way you do it is basically you start by opening a, a cache, uh, and then you keep on caching all the files. Um, and then basically you have make sure to confirm that all of the files have been cached as well. Um, so looking at the, the install callback, once the, the service worker has been installed, um, you go through all the different files, um, open the cache, uh, and then make sure they all sort of load there. Um, and basically, um, when you have the fetch event, um, you can also use the uh, respond with method, uh, and you pass in a promise from the caches.match. Um, and it basically, it looks at the result, and, and it finds any results from any of the caches that the service worker already has created. And then, of course, if you want to sort of keep on caching new requests cumulatively, um, there are a number of ways that you can do that as well. That, that's basically how much code I can fit into a slide. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, it's still s sort of readable. 
but then, of course, um, when you're using a caching approach to, to stuff, um, you want to make sure that you have files that are sort of accurate or, or up to date, because sometimes it doesn't really come back the way you expect them to be. So, which kind of leads me to the part of updating a service worker, uh, which is a slightly longer list. So basically, the first step is that you update the JavaScript service worker file that you have. And, and it's sort of said that you know, if it's only one byte that has been changed for that file, um, it will retrieve that file. Um, and, <coughs> and also, when the uh, install event is being fired, uh, the new service worker will go into a, um, a waiting state. Uh, and then when all the pages are sort of being dependent on the, the prior version of the service worker that you already have on your web page, when they're sort of close and when they're let go, uh, the new service worker kicks in um, and it also gets to activate events. So you know that there actually are the new files being cached. And then when you work with, with cache management, um, you can also have whitelisting. So basically you can more or less purge all the different caching that you have uh, by sort of manual commands um, in the JavaScript code. But you can also list the different files or directories, for instance, that, uh, that shouldn't be purged. Uh, so basically just whitelisting from purging. Then another thing that has been um, asked for a lot when you meet developers and you know, what's the thing or what's the API that's being missing on the web uh, is push notifications. Um, so from Chrome 42, uh, you have the push API and the notification API. Uh, and basically, uh, the push API, it relies on web app manifests and, and service workers because you need some extra power there. Um, and sort of interesting, like how many people have you tried building web apps or using manifest files? It's actually more than I expected. Um, like it's not that it's, well, not, not to disrespect you, it's not that complicated, uh, but it's great that you tried it. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying that. Um, but looking when you start um, uh, start creating the, the push notifications, you have a number of different checks you go through, like uh, service worker support, uh, and if they're being registered. Um, and then you also have the part about the user permission, like if the user actually um, approves of the app being able to, to push notifications to you, so you can see if it's uh, being uh, allowed or if it's being denied. Uh, and then when you have both the notification and, and the push support checked, then you can also check if there's actually an ongoing subscription going on from the website. So HTML-wise, it's pretty easy. You put a button in there, um, progressive enhancement, et cetera, um, and you can just attach an event to it. Um, and then you can also make sure that for the service worker, um, if you have the show notification support and if that works or not. Um, and then you go into notification permission. Um, and basically, for notification, uh, notifications, uh, if the user has denied it, that's going to be the, the permanent state until the user actually changes it. So you can't just sort of keep on polling and or forcing them. Um, and then you sort of go on um, to checking that uh, um, push or push messaging is being supported as well. And then as a whole, we sort of done all of these checks from, from the flowchart, um, you register the, the service worker, and then you actually start subscribing to stuff. And talking about web apps and manifest file, th this could basically be a, a complete manifest file. Um, like you have the, the name and, and short name for app, icons for different resolutions, et cetera. Um, and uh, within your HTML code, you would have a link element that would just point to where the manifest file is, so the web page loading it actually knows where to look for it and go through it. Um, the two last lines here, it, it's kind of an extra thing, like because if you have push messaging and you have a, pl a platform somewhere pushing out all these messages, um, for instance, if you with the Google Cloud messaging platform, um, these are the two parameters that you would need. Uh, so it's just a nice option with the developer consult, you can try it out. And another part, uh, and, and this is kind of an interesting challenge, like, um, and kind of a cliche to say something like this, but how do you make web apps um, first-class citizens on devices? Like, you, you can offer a number of different APIs, you can have offline support, et cetera. Uh, 
But to begin with, um, a number of people, I mean, many of us are probably used to and like putting in a URL and they will get the content, but many other people, they go into app stores and other ways. So, so if they actually do visit a web page on their mobile, how can you make sure that they know they, they can install it side by side with all the other apps? And with Add to Home Screen, and again, in Chrome 42, uh, you can get an app install banner, uh, which basically means that um, we, within Chrome, suggest to the user that they can install it directly as an app on the device. And there are a few prerequisites for that. Uh, you need to have a web app manifest file that sort of describes the app and the content and, and logos, et cetera. Um, you need to use a service worker. Um, and again, coming back to HTTPS, uh, <coughs> and, <coughs> sorry. and the final criteria, uh, which is kind of interesting, uh, that we have right now is that a user has visited the, the site twice over two separate days um, during two, two connected weeks. Uh, so just to make sure that, that, you know, because otherwise right now if you go to a mobile website and, and after about half a second, it's like, do you want to install our app? And it covers all the entire content. Or do you want to take a survey about our website? I don't know. I haven't seen the website yet. Um, so I think the important part here is, is kind of the delicate balance of when do you ask the user? When do you show the user that there's actually a benefit for them? Because you know you, you seem to be going to this website a lot, and that's good for you, but do you know that you can actually install it or, or have another way of using it? So my hope, at least, and, and, and talking with web developers, is that you see all of these things and, and that you're thinking, like, this this is a fantastic. Can I, can I do all of this? And yeah, you can. And that's what I wanted to cover tonight. Uh, thank you.